Hello, welcome to my presentation on what is area under the curve. So this is for the KH 468 lab at uh, Miami University. And uh, this is meant to be watched prior to going to the lab uh, for O2 deficit and epoch, lab number five. Um, but it can be watched at any time and by anyone. And hopefully you learn a little bit about what area under the curve is, as well as why we want to solve things like for area. Have a little bit more idea of what area of the curve is. Well, quite simply, it's the net area between a function in relation to an axis on the graph. So we have an example here where we have a, this is an exponential function actually, I can tell you that, and it's the exponential plus one. So x squared plus one and so at zero, it's just one, and then at two, it's two squared is four, and plus one is five. So easy enough. What we want to figure out, though, to have some general idea of what the area is, we want to find from the starting point, zero, x, zero, one, and two, five. We want to figure out what this area is in relation to the x-axis, so the area under this curve from 0 to 2 of x. Or we could figure it out from 1 to 5, which would be from here to here of the function. So there's multiple different types of areas that we could define. Typically, we are interested in the x-axis, though, as well as uh, being able to generalize it to higher dimensions, so three dimensions and so on. But we'll keep it simple and just do it with respect to the x-axis. So you probably learned about area in some sort of fixed context, uh, like say an area of a rectangle or a square, which is simply just its length times its width. However, you may not have learned where that came from or how to generalize the idea of what area is to other objects that may be not um, a rectangle or may not be a square or circle or triangle and so on and so forth. Those are what we call Euclidean shapes, things that are very fixed, very easy to kind of define once we have some idea about them. So that comes into something called the area problem. So how do we figure out how much of something we have area-wise if a shape is irregular? So that's one thing that we're gonna answer using by going through this and using some knowledge Another thing with that is the units will not always be something squared, like meter squared or feet squared. So in relation to our area of a rectangle or a square, length times width, we usually have a length, and that's in meters, say, and then width as well, and that gets us meters squared. And that could be like, a, say, a length of a fence. Length of a fence, width of a fence, maybe around a yard and it's the same on both sides so we can use area of a rectangle and we can get that area so to speak so why do we want to do this well we just want to know how much for at least our purposes and in the context of the lab that's coming up how much oxygen that someone's used over some period of time from that we can also get things such as energy expenditure. So how much kcals of energy did they use over that period of time? And a little bit further, let's take a general definition of what, um, how we find area under some function. So this looks a little complicated if you've never had calculus before. Um, that's okay, calculus one. So this little s here, this elongated s looking thing is the integrand and we have some interval, lower bounds a, upper bound b. In the case of the example that we just had before, we would plug zero in for this and two in for this. So zero to two and we'd have some function x squared or so, um, x squared plus one and we integrate this with respect to x. dx is what we write, but we integrate with respect to x, some change in x. 
However, we're not going to have a function for what we're doing. So we'll have to use an approximation method using a summation of all these little tiny slivers that we cut up into the data. And so we have our y values here. Our y values are going to be VO2, a rate, volume of oxygen as a rate, liters per minute, milliliters per kilogram of body weight per minute. We add two, two that are basically right next to each other if you're looking in Excel. Um, it's just two breaths, consecutive breaths, divided by two, and then we multiply by the difference in time. Time will be on our x-axis on some interval a, b. So we'll be using what's called the Riemann sums, and that's the trapezoidal area under the curve, if you've heard of that or looked it up before. Let's do an example. This is going to be a very simple example. So someone's exercising at three liters of O2 per minute. So the liters of O2 per minute tells us this is a rate. Cool. So for 30 minutes, they're doing that for 30 minutes. Consistently, they're at three liters of O2, a rate per minute for 30 minutes. And the question is, how much O2 or oxygen did they consume over the exercise period? So let's do something with this. I'm going to draw this in sort of a more geometric interpretation. I'm going to take the 30 minutes as our x, present it here, and we will take the 3 liters of O2 per minute as a rate for our y. That's going to be a height, 3 liters of O2 per minute. Now, for those of you who may be able to recognize, this line, we just took it all the way up through this height, through three liters, would be the same, the same length all throughout. If we were to draw it anywhere on here, it'd be the same length. And in fact, I'm going to draw that right there so we can see that. And then if we had this line, three liters of about two per minute, we can see that this would be the same height all the way throughout. So I hope that you can tell that this looks like a rectangle. And as you saw in the previous slide, you already know how to calculate the area of a rectangle. And that's just simply length times width. So area equals 3 times 30. And the units that we get for that is 90 liters of O2. So essentially the minutes cancel out. If you're familiar with stoichiometry or unit cancellations, that's all we're doing here. And we're left with 90 liters of O2 per minute. I also would like to present this using the definite integral just to show you what's going on, kind of underlying what's going on behind the scenes. Okay, so here is the integral form of what's really going on. So that integrand with respect to dt on the bounds of 0 to 30. So 0 is our start time, 30 is our end time. And we have that constant 30, or not, sorry, 3. 3, as I said, is the average, and it's what we could call a constant or a constant function, meaning there's just going to be a line going throughout the entire thing and unchanging. Now we do know it does slightly change here and there. Oxygen does, usage does change slightly, but it's basically around this line and we just drew an average through it. So if we want to integrate this, we want to essentially do the, or undo the power rule, and we get 3t. This is not 3 times dt, just so you know, but we want to have a general formula for the area. And we do that by integrating 3 res with respect to time, undoing the power rule, we get 3t, and that's on the interval of 0 to 30. We're going to evaluate that on the interval of 0 to 30. So we always plug in the upper bound first, 30 into t, and we subtract that from minus, uh, subtract that from 30, the, sorry, 3 times 0, like so. So 3 times this t is 30, minus 3 times t of 0. And that gets us 90 minus 0, and we just essentially end up with 90 liters of O2. So that's basically what's going on behind the scenes 
does get a lot more complicated than that, but this is a very easy example of to demonstrate you what's essentially going on behind the scenes. All right, and just to put a point on it, we have 90 liters of O2 per for that exercise. That's it. That's how much oxygen that they consumed over that period of time. So some examples of how we'll implement this. We'll be using it again for VO2. So this is VO2, and this would be what's called a positional vector, or what would, what would be equivalent to a distance vector, such as this is going to be liters, but this could also be meters or some sort of example like that. And this VO2 has a dot over it. That means it's the first derivative, or it's a rate, some sort of rate. This would be equivalent to, say, a velocity, so meters per minute, or meters per second, meters per hour, so on and so forth. So we integrate that with respect to time, some time interval, t1 to t2, and this is just what we'll be doing with it. Don't worry, you won't have to do this full on out because you'll be doing this for 400 data points. You're not going to be doing it by hand, you'll be doing it in Excel in the actual tutorial. All that's happening here is we're integrating the rate of O2 usage, the velocity or first derivative, with respect to time, which gets us a positional quantity or um, how many liters or how many milliliters per kilogram of body weight that they consumed of O2 over some period of time. And then we, can, we will also be doing it for work. We could do it for work now, but we will be doing that later. And for this, we integrate force F with respect to linear displacement. And then using force again, we're going to be getting impulse later in the semester when we do some vertical jumps. We'll be integrating force with respect to time, not linear displacement like before. We'll be integrating it with respect to time. And so some interval T1, T2, and so on. So let's look at our idealized O2 deficit in epoch. So we start with resting O2 consumption. Someone in the lab is just going to be sitting in a chair, hanging out for five minutes. And then after five minutes, they will start exercise on the treadmill at either 50 or 70% of their VO2 max. So as soon as they start, there is an O2 requirement that is needs to be met. We meet that in other ways than using O2 because O2 is a little bit slow to utilize uh, to its maximal capacity or the capacity that we need it to for that exercise. So we're our O2 requirements up here. However, our oxygen is still down here. And in this idealized, it's steadily rising like so here. And instead of using, say, the x-axis, we actually set the baseline at the O2 requirement. So anything below that, essentially, is going to be a negative value. Anything above it would be a positive value. And essentially, we just want to find this area right here, this purple shaded area. That gets us the O2 deficit. So how much oxygen they are in deficit of when they are doing exercise, at least from the start of exercise. And then at some point they reach more or less a steady state of O2 consumption. And then we stop exercise. For our purposes, we will be stopping at 10 minutes of exercise, so about 15 minutes into the actual um, experiment. And then their O2 demand, at least from an exercise standpoint, is down here, back to so-called rest they'll be sitting back down again, just like they were when they were resting. Now, their O2 is going to still be elevated because they need to uh, rephosphorylate, they need to uh, get their heart rates back down, replenish ATP phosphocreatine, and other things that you'll be going over in lab. So the O2 demand is still up here, but the requirement is still much lower, is much lower, it needs to be down at rest. So it will come on down in some over some period of time. We'll be only doing this for five minutes. However, if we were to wait over a period of time, 
it'll be different for people, but waiting over some period of time, they will eventually get back to rest and not have any sort of uh, deficit anymore. So this area that they're breathing up here versus their rest you know, to consumption level is what we call the epoch, their excess, so excess is in higher than they, they need, post-exercise oxygen consumption. So as I said, this is the idealized version. Let's take a look at how it So all these red triangles, upside down triangles, are the data points from someone's actual O2 deficit lab, a previous one. And this is about 400 total data points. They're sitting, sitting, sitting here. And then at five minutes, they started exercise. O2 requirement up here at this level. And so anything below this is a negative value. And anything above it, so we can see there's some above it, would be a positive value. So this is breath by breath data. So that we got a data point every time that they exhaled, so to speak. And we're essentially measuring what's going on, what what do we have at the lung level. And then we're making inferences about what's going on at the cellular level or the mitochondrial level overall. But we need the breath by breath data because otherwise we may miss some important features if we were to say use 15 second averaging, one minute averaging, and so on for this data. So Starting from zero, I have a blue line here that shows the O2 deficit over time. So from the start of exercise, we can see it's going down, 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 because we're accumulating a deficit. And about here, minute and a half, maybe two minutes in, it's starting to take on a different rate. So we've caught up to it mostly. However, we're not exactly there just yet. And so it takes on a different characteristic slope to about, say, eight, well, sorry, about four minutes in, three to four minutes in. That would be about eight to nine minutes overall for this entire period. And then it's slowly, slowly, slowly meandering its way on down. We're just barely accumulating some deficit overall. And that can come down to what we're measuring at the lungs and so on. Then after 15 minutes, so 10 minutes of exercise, they stopped and sat immediately down in a chair on the treadmill and they're breathing more than they need. So their workload requirement is at this level and anything above that would be in excess of what they need. And so this black line just demonstrates the epoch, the cumulative sum over that period of time. And so they are getting back to resting level. Uh, they're lessening the deficit or the debt, so to speak. And if we were to run this out further and further and further, they would eventually get back to zero. Uh, we only did five minutes of rest. That's usually too short for them to get back to that resting level of, for deficit, for, to make up all the deficit, so to speak. We can see that they're at the resting level fairly quick, about maybe a minute and a half to two minutes after stopping exercise, but we can see that they're pretty close. So this concludes my demonstration of what area under the curve is and demonstrating it in the context of this, uh, of this lab. So if you have any questions, please contact your lab instructor or you can contact me. I'm happy to go over anything with you. Um, hope you found this video informative and look forward to discussing more with you in the next video. Thank you.